Good evening, good evening. Um, tonight, Tibetan Book of the Dead. Before I go into it, I'd like to uh, mention a couple of names. Um, Some years ago, back in the early 50s, uh, I had the opportunity of studying with Lama Tada. And he was a remarkable person on many levels. And I'd like to just share with you a little bit about Lama Tada. We were in a, might call it an informal class, three of us studying with Lama Tata. Lama Tata was Japanese, and he was in his 80s at the time. And uh, he said that some years earlier, in his late 20s, maybe middle 20s, he went to his Zen master, he was a Buddhist priest, monk, and said to his Zen master, I think we've lost touch with the roots of Buddhism. And his Zen master said, good, go find them. He said, thank you. So he went down to the docks, and he got transportation by working as a deckhand. And he ended up in India. And he worked his way all the way north into Tibet without supplies or anything else. So I asked him, I said, good heavens, in those days, he went through Bhutan. I said, isn't that very dangerous? Tribes, uh, they just live by banditry because life is so frugal and difficult to live. He said, oh, yeah. So I said, well, how did you manage to get through all of that countryside? He laughed. He said, <laughs> he said uh, no one robs a, a, a nude man. He took all his clothes off. <laughs> he worked his way up into Tibet. When he got to Tibet, he studied uh, there in Tibet, and he became the 13th Dalai Lama's teacher, one of his teachers. And when he left Tibet, they gave him the entire uh, complete set of the Tibetan Tripitaka, which is three baskets, which is the basic canon of Buddhism as developed by the Tibetans in part from Sanskrit. And they loaded him up, they loaded him up in a great caravan, and the caravan went back down, of course, and he made it back to Japan with this great treasure. And he came to the United States because he was promised by a, a very influential person with great money to start a study center where we would then do translations and make all of that material available. Uh, as fortune had it, of course, uh, he got here with all of his material, the Trapedica, and the funds were cut off and he was stranded in the United States. So he went around giving talks and raised the money he needed and the texts got back to Tibet. But before they did, many of them were copied by Stanford University, which then has, a, at that time for many years, had the only copy of the, tri the complete Trapedica of uh, the Tibetan canon. Well, we worked on two basic works. I was studying Tibetan with him, and one was uh, Milarepa, and the other one, of course, was the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And we had a lot of fun with him. He was a very fine man. Uh, just as an aside, I'll tell you just one fun story you can tell. With this story, I think, something about the man. Uh, wherever he went, uh, he'd just sit, and we always wanted to see whether we could catch him asleep or not. I never could catch him asleep. <laughs> it looked like he was asleep, never asleep. And the other thing was that he liked to go down to Mission, where at that, in those days, they had a store after storefront after storefront of used artifacts and, and essentially junk of a variety, a wide variety of, of kinds. And he'd go through the store and he'd say, Pierre, 
what'd they throw this away for? And I go, oh, no. <laughs> it, what'd they throw that away for? I said, I don't know. I mean, they didn't need it. Beautiful. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's Lamentata. So I wanted to share my story with Lamentata. But part of it is a certain section of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which I'd like to go into. But first, I'd like to use first the Evans Vents translation. Because in the Evans Vents translation, Carl Jung did a remarkable introduction. And Carl Jung, of course, is one of the great thinkers of uh, Europe and the field of psychology and comparative religion and philosophy. And then I'd like to say a few things about Lama Govinda, who also wrote an introduction, as did uh, Sir Thomas Woodruff, sometimes called Arthur Avalon. Jung, in the introduction to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, that's this one, claims that it was through the study of the Tibetan Book of the Dead that he actually came up with many of his great theories. And he said it was his constant companion. And uh, he said from the very, see when it was first published, it published in German, got into German. And his translation into English was delayed for several years. So we used to pass around an English translation of the German commentary of Carl Jung in those days. So here's his, a quote from Carl Jung's introduction, psychological commentary. For years, ever since it was first published, the Bardo Thodo has been my constant companion. And to it I owe not only many stimulating ideas and discoveries, but also many fundamental insights. Unlike the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which always prompts one to say too much or too little, the Bardo Thodo offers one an, intel an intelligible philosophy addressed to human beings rather than to gods or to primitive savages. Next point he makes, which is very important for Carl Jung and the history of this field. He said, the Bardo Thodol is um, psychological in its outlook because all metaphysical statements, according to Carl Jung, are statements about the psyche. And as such, since they are statements about the psyche, you can then examine the metaphysical assertions and find the processes of the psyche. You can, you can watch the words, you can see the processes the words presuppose, and you can then learn a great deal about the dynamics of the psyche. So I'm going to read you a, a very nice point he makes here. It is the soul which by the divine creative power inherent in it makes metaphysical assertions. It posits the distinctions between metaphysical entities. Not only is it the condition of all metaphysical reality, it is that reality. And the quote that he likes most from this entire work, uh, I'm sure you're going to share in liking it as well. He reflects, and he's, Jung says, now this, as far as he's concerned, is a very towering quote, very fine quote. Two small paragraphs. Now, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, as you probably know, is a sometimes called a funerary uh, br uh, brief that's read when someone is dying. It's read into their left ear, and it's read uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, and the assumption is that the person is still able to access it and therefore use whatever it is that you're saying to them in a positive way to help them in their journey into the next reincarnation. The uh, Tibetan uh, Book of the Dead is really um, 
a picture that looks somewhat like this is life and this is death. Though when you get through the story, you'll see that perhaps it should be reversed. Born, die. The first state, the first state one encounters, depending, and it's very brief for many people, it's only as long as the flickering of an eye. It's called a chikai. That is an experience of ultimate reality. Then, for the next seven days, there's a period called the Chanyid and the Sitba. Now, we're going to talk about these are planes. Bardo, actually, the word Bardo in Tibetan is bar. Do. Do means um, <clears throat> a mark. Uh, it's a mark. It can also be an island. It can, it, it's a mark. Uh, same word for island. It's, it's something that distinguishes something. It marks it. Bar is the word for whenever you're dealing with something, it's that which you can describe as something that can locate it in between. So it's a, it's a mark it marks between, see, it's a mark between. And that's what this is, it's between life and death. Each one of these divisions are marks within which the psyche plays out its drama. So at death you have this overwhelming experience, in some cases so brief, that as we said before, it's just like a, a blinking, blinking of an eye. Then seven days here, this is karmic. This is really karmic propensities, all the karmic. From this point on, uh, this moves into what are called the wrathful, from the peaceful to the wrathful deities. And it's the processes, it's the processes the soul goes through as it then selectively chooses its next reincarnation. So this is really a book about your life, your death, and how you choose your next reincarnation. And that goes down to, <clears throat> always it goes down to even to uh, what area, what geographical area, what kind of family, what kind of religion you'll be reborn into. All of that is, takes place in this. This entire thing is said to take place in 49 days. So the whole thing is a 49 day journey. Now, as I said, I would very much like to read you a quote from Carl Jung, and he's going to describe the Chikai state. That's the, <clears throat> the uh, first glimpse of ultimate reality that one encounters when one dies. And these are the words, by the way, which are also spoken to the person who has just died, spoken now obviously into the left ear, which is the one that hears into the next world. O oh, nobly born, then the name, listen. Now thou, thou art experiencing the radiance of the clear light of pure reality. Recognize it. O nobly born, thy present intellect, in real nature void, not formed into anything as regards characteristics of color, it's naturally void, is the very reality, the all good. Okay, second paragraph. Thine own intellect, which is now voidness, yet not to be regarded as the voidness of nothingness, but as being the intellect itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, and blissful, is the very consciousness, the all-good Buddha. Now, there's, in Buddhism, there's, of course, a, a, a name for this. This is called the Dharmakaya, by the way, right? Dharmakaya. 
the kaya is a body. There are three bodies of the Buddha or th three uh, basic metaphysical entities on the highest level. And the highest is the dharmakaya. And we just got a description of it. Uh, dharma is a word that goes through a whole range of splendid meanings from law to principle. And therefore, this is sometimes said to be the luminous body of the Buddha. Now, Carl Jung focuses on this, and he says this is the state of perfect enlightenment. And I'd like to just do a couple of more quotes from Carl Jung. The soul is, a, is assuredly not small, but the radiant Godhead itself. That's what the soul is. So the soul is itself radiant. Right. So, so that's what it is, the, the Godhead. The problem, therefore, if it is, why is it that we don't see it? Well, that's the veil theory. Right. There's something blocking our vision of our own reality. Um, and this is where Carl Jung introduces his own spiritual advice. Somehow we always have a wrong attitude to these things, he says. But if we can master ourselves far enough to refrain from our chief ever, chief era of always wanting to do something with things and put them to practical use, we may perhaps succeed in learning an important lesson from these teachings or at least in appreciating the greatness of the bardo thuddle, which vouchsafes to the dead man the ultimate and the highest truth that even the gods are the radiance and reflection of our own souls. Now, um, this period of the Chanyid this is where Carl Jung says he was able to find what he calls the insight into the archetypes in psychology. He said, this is really, the Chanyet is really, and he uses uh, Plato's forms. He said, this is Plato's forms as well, uh, a day, right? Uh, um, not forms. Plato's forms. So this is Plato's forms. It's the way the mind organizes its contents. And then he goes to Carl Jung. It's the categories, analogous to logical categories, which are always and everywhere present in all of the basic postulates of reason. He says, but behind it, behind it, still there is something quite, a, quite significant here because. The original structure of the psyche has within it eternally inherited forms and ideas which have no specific content. The specific content only appears in the course of individual's life when personal experience is taken up precisely in these forms. If the archetypes were not pre-existent, identical everywhere, we could not explain the fact postulated in almost every turn of the bardo that the dead do not know that they are dead. He said, that's the most important thing in this whole Tibetan Book of the Dead. That curious statement is the dead don't know they're dead. And therefore, the benefit of this kind of teaching, assuming it can do what it does, is to wake up. It repeats one phrase repeatedly throughout the entire session over and over and over again. Recognize, 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 recognize that thou art dead. Recognize what you are facing. Recognize that now you are in the clear light. Recognize what you're passing through are all the karmic influences of all of your past reincarnations, all of them. Right? And now you're going through the processes of reincarnation. Face the archetypal images Recognize them for what they are. They're projections of your own mind. These are projections the most fearful 
and it becomes increasingly more fearful, which then hurls the soul seeking reincarnation. Now, um, there are other n nice things in Carl Jung's introduction, but I'm going to uh, put it aside. Um, and I would recommend you, if you're interested, in, certainly to get this volume, because that's one of its great merits. Now, <clears throat> so just to pull things together, all right, it's his constant companion. The soul and metaphysical assertions are nothing other than statements of the of consciousness itself. Um, this is exactly what we said a moment ago, that these are karmic illusions in the Chan Yid period. Uh, that's the forms in um, Adola and the archetypes. Now, In another introduction to Evans Vance's introduction, pardon me, another introduction to the Tibetan Book of the Dead is by Lama Govinda. Now, he has very fine statements. And um, he fills in some very interesting ideas that might help us when we go into the book, into the idea of the book itself. And it's only a short number of pages, but there are a couple of things I would like to bring up to your attention so we can get into it in a little deeper level in a few minutes. Um, there's a very important issue, perhaps I should uh, mention it right now. Um, there is a tension between um, Govinda, Evans Vance, and Trungpa. A very important issue. And that's going to be dealt with, and we'll get to it, but right now, the important point about it is that Lama Govinda, um, in the past has visited LA and these areas and in San Francisco. And the, the whole drama behind Govinda, uh, as you probably know, he is a, a Lama, he's a German, originally German, and he lived uh, for many years in Northern India and in a monastery and has a very fine center over there. And he is one of the great spokesmen for the Tibetan philosophy of this kind. Lama Govinda takes great issue with this book, this translation. And Trungpa, who, as you know, was um, um, a Rinpoche, a, t a t Tibetan high priest, and yoga, and he had a big center in Colorado before he died. And he too takes issue with Evan Vence's translation on just one issue, and the whole drama revolves around how you're going to describe the Chikai Bardo plan. That's, that's the whole issue, it comes down to that. Because there are two things that are going on in here, and that is the intellect and consciousness. And however you describe them and the way they are functioning and said to be functioning in this work will put you in one camp or the other. So. I'd like to now say just a couple of things because Lama Govinda is very helpful at this point. Applying the Bardo Thodol teachings, it's a matter of remembering the right thing at the right moment. But in order to remember, one must prepare oneself mentally during one's lifetime one must create, build up, cultivate those facilities, faculties, 
which one desires to be of, of deciding influence at death and in the after death state in order never to be taken unawares and to be able to react spontaneously in the right way when the critical moment of death and after death occurs. The different bardos in betweens represent states of consciousness of our life, the state of waking consciousness, normal consciousness of a being born into the human world, the state of dream consciousness, the state of trance consciousness, the state in profound meditation, the state of experiencing death, the state of experiencing reality, the state of rebirth consciousness. Now, each one of those are transition points. And if it's a transition point, it's a bardo. Because a bardo means in between mark. The word, right? So in this work, all the transition points from breathing, right, from one thought between another, all transition points between heartbeats, between birth and death, between waking and sleeping, all the transition points are opportunities to experience this shikai. So what does our good friend Govinda say? He says, hey, look, it's a matter of importance that we remember the right thing at the right time, and therefore all of the studies that you do now, right, all that you create, build up, cultivate, that then, therefore, is accessible at these key moments. Um, Sir Arthur, uh, the, the Sir John Woodruff, Arthur Avalon, uh, another name for the same gentleman, also wrote an introduction. And I'll, this is interesting too. Um, um, he's into Tantra. If you want a good book, any book, any good books on Tantra, of course, uh, Arthur Woodruff or um, Sir John Wolf, pardon me, Sir John Woodruff, Arthur Avalon is his other name. Uh, you must get his books. Um, he takes this to be a Tantric work, and he makes his uh, statement in this introduction, um, and puts it in terms of Kundalini Yoga, and uh, I'll just read one section and, and get out of it. Um, He makes a distinction between the peaceful and the wrathful deities, and he relates it to Tantra. And uh, I'd like to just read that one section. The peaceful devadattas are said to issue from the heart, the wrathful from the head. I do not, however, think that this statement necessarily lets in the yoga doctrine of the serpent power and the six centers, which the editor has shortly set out in part two of the addendum, which he did in the end of the book. Um, I myself think that the mention of the heart and the head does not refer to these pages as yoga centers, but possibly to the fact that peaceful deities reflect, as stated in the text, the love of the deceased which springs from his heart and only secondarily from those two centers. So, um, I would allow not to um, shift gears now. And Oh yes, yeah, I, I would like to do this. This is interesting. Why 49 days? According to Tibetan view of uh, the cosmos, 
uh, the, the universe can be divided up into seven worlds. And within each of these worlds, there are seven degrees, and therefore that's 49 altogether. Um, the goal of, the whole goal of evolution to um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and as it commented on by uh, Woodruff and Govinda, is that the human race is moving towards the evolution of consciousness to pure consciousness and making that available to man as a race, but it's first achieved by individuals, and these individuals are precursors to the evolutionary forces. Next, he talks about, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead talks about five different kinds of wisdoms, and he relates them, Govinda relates them to the five elements and as they are understood, and he reduces this entire set of philosophical, um, you might say, um, principles, philosophical principles or teachings to 21 statements. And I'm not going to read all 21, but uh, I'm sure you want to hear some of them. Um, here in Govinda's section. Well, I guess I'll have to use my memory. But they're so well stated. Voila. All possible conditions, states or realms of our everyday existence, sansaric existence, the heavens, hells, worlds, are entirely dependent upon phenomena. In other words, are nothing other than phenomena. All phenomena, transitory, illusory, Unreal, other than the mind perceiving them. That in reality there are no such beings anywhere as gods, demons, spirits, or sentient creatures. All alike being phenomena dependent upon a cause. And this cause is the thirsting after sensation, after the unstable samsaric existence, which is pure Buddhism. I'm skipping here, I want to go to a couple. Enlightenment is nothing other than the realization of the unreality of sangsara existence. That training in yoga, the control of thinking processes, so as able to concentrate the mind in an effort to reach right knowledge is essential. That teaching must be had under a human guru or teacher. The greatest of the gurus or teachers in this cycle of time is, of course, the Buddha. That's a Buddhist word. Um, that all there is is reality. He who realizes nirvana, the Buddha Gautama himself has spoken to his own disciples in this way. There is disciples, a realm devoid of 
earth and water, fire and air. It's not endless space, but infinite thought, nor nothingness, neither ideas nor non-ideas. Not this world, nor that it is. I call it neither a coming nor a departing, nor a standing still, nor death, nor birth. It is without a basis, progress. It's the ending of sorrow. So that's the, I just read a few of them. Okay, now, I'd like to turn to the Chikai stain. Because that's the major one. Now, a couple of key terms, the Dharmadatta, is the luminosity. It isn't merely luminosity. It means in that luminosity you're at, you are grasping the essence of things just the way they are. Right? Just so. And now we're going to go into this curious problem of describing the Chikai state. I have uh, two translations. Now, this is the great moment. I'm in the part one of page 94 to 97 about. Keeping thyself unseparated from this resolution, thou should try to remember whatever devotional practices you were accustomed to perform during this lifetime. This is advice being given now to the person who just died. In saying this, the reader shall put his lips close to the ear and shall repeat it distinctly, clearly impressing it upon the dying person so as to prevent his mind from wandering even for a moment. After the expiration has completely ceased, press the nerve of sleep firmly. And a lama or a person higher or more learned than thyself, impress in these words, Reverend Sir, now that art now that thou art experiencing the fundamental clear light, try to abide in that state which now thou art experiencing. O, noble, o, o nobly born, listen. Thou art experiencing the radiance of the clear light of pure reality. Recognize it. O nobly born, thy present intellect in real nature void, not formed into anything as regard characteristics or color, naturally void, is the very reality, the all good. Thine own intellect, which is now voidness, yet not to be regarded as the voidness of nothingness, but as being the intellect itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, and blissful, is the very consciousness, the all-good Buddha. Thine own consciousness, not formed into anything, in reality void, and the intellect shining and blissful, these two are inseparable. The union of them is the Dharmakaya state of perfect enlightenment. When these two are pure, that is the Dharmakaya. That's perfect enlightenment. And what's the distinction between those two? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked. You have to be very, you have to read it very carefully to pick it up. And you're absolutely right to make me going back into it. So let me do a couple more paragraphs, we'll go back into it. Watch now. Now he's talking about consciousness. So, Thine own consciousness, 
shining, void, inseparable from the great body of radiance, no birth, no death, and is the immutable light Buddha Amitabha. Knowing this is sufficient, recognizing the voidance of thine own intellect to be Buddhahood, and looking upon it as being thine own consciousness is to keep thyself in the state of the divine mind of the Buddha. <clears throat> Repeat this distinctly and clearly. Three times, seven times. That will recall to the mind of the dying one, the former. That's all there is. To the, that's the whole thing, Shikai said. Just those few paragraphs. So let's go back. Okay. What's, your, what's our job? To see whether a different set of terms apply to one and another. There's an overlap. Look for the difference. I'm going to go back right over it again. See? O nobly born, now that now thou art experiencing the radiance of the clear light of pure reality. Recognize it. Okay. Now, the intellect. O nobly born thy or your present intellect in real nature void, not formed into anything regarding characteristics or color, naturally void. That's the very reality, the all good. Thine own intellect, which is now voidness, yet not to be regarded as the voidness of nothingness, but as being the intellect itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, blissful. Shining, thrilling, blissful, the very pure consciousness. Unobstructed, right? Okay, four terms. Unobstructed, right? Shining, thrilling, blissful. That's the very consciousness, the all good. Thine own consciousness now, he goes on the other side, <clears throat> is in reality void. And the intellect shining and blissful The intellect itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, blissful. Right? Thine own consciousness, not formed into anything, in reality void. The intellect shining and blissful, repeats, shining, blissful. He doesn't give these two qualities to pure consciousness throughout the entire work. There's an overlap. <clears throat> so I'll go back over and you can see it again. Recognize thy present intellect in real nature void, not formed into anything as regard characteristics, color naturally void. But as being the, the, the intellect itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, and blissful, is the very consciousness, the all Buddha all good Buddha. Thine own consciousness not formed in anything in reality void and the intellect shining and blissful, these two are inseparable. These two are inseparable. Right. 
let's call them what they call it, the union. They're inseparable. The union of them is the Dharmakaya, the state of perfect enlightenment. Thine own consciousness, now the overlap, shining, so it picks up shining, void, inseparable from the great body of radiance, has no birth, death, is the immutable light. So then he always does this because, look here, there is something about this word that it can apply to two states. Would you not agree that a overwhelming radiance, a divine luminosity, a divine luminosity <clears throat> can be described as shining, thrilling, blissful and nothing obstructs it. Okay, no. Say, is it possible that there are times when we can go out, probably away from LA, where we encounter up in the mountains, perhaps, a sky that is absolutely clear of clouds, pure? Is there not a shining quality to that sky. See, the word shining can go both ways, both as radiance and a pure empty sky. They're both, they can, both are brilliant, both have a brilliance. The difference, however, is these two. Now, we're now going to get into this wonderful world where we can now talk about things that we've just described and put names on them. Okay, the Dharmakaya, that's where we're going. The all good the all good is called pure intellect. The all good, all good Buddha. So I'd like to introduce two terms for you now. The all good father, the all good mother. Here we get into Tibetan philosophy. In this experience, a distinction is being made between pure intellect and pure consciousness. Which goes with which? That's the whole issue. Which goes with which? and I'll let you make up your mind. According to the great perfectionist school in Tibetan philosophy, the father is that which, is that which appears, the mother that which is conscious of what appears. Therefore, the mother is going to be pure consciousness. What appears is this divine luminosity and radiance. Therefore, this must be masculine, this must be feminine. The union of the two right, on the highest level
is in um, Tibetan thought. Um, the Dharmakaya, it's also uh, given a name in uh, Tibetan, um, which is a very beautiful name. Um, the uh, Chonyed Kuntu Sang Po. And I'm just going to stay on one word, po, the last syllable, right? Po and mo. Okay? Whether you get one or the other, father or mother. Again, bliss is the father, the voidness, perceiving it, the mother, the radiance, the father, the voidness, perceiving it, the mother, the intellect, the father, the voidness, the mother. The repetition of the term void is to emphasize the importance of knowing. The intellect to be in reality void, that is of the nature of uh, voidness. Unborn, uncreated, unshaped, primordial. I'm on page 95, 96, in case any of you want to check this out. In this state, the experiencer and the thing experienced are inseparably one and the same. As the yellowness, yellowness of gold cannot be separated from gold, nor saltiness from salt. For the normal human intellect, this transcend transcendental state is to be on comprehension. From the union of the two states of mind, or consciousness, implied by the two terms, the all good father, the all good mother, is born the state of the Dharmakaya, a state of perfect enlightenment Buddhahood. The Dharmakaya symbolizes the purest and the highest state of being, the state of supermundane consciousness, devoid of all mental limitations or obscurations which arise from the contact, contact of the primordial consciousness with matter. Well, I could read some more, but that's basically it. Now let me shift. And uh, this is the same book from. Uh, Tibetan book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and this is Trungpa's um, translation. In the foreword, however, he makes an interesting point which I'd like to pull you to. Kazi Dawa Samdup, which is the translator who worked with Evans Vence, changed the translation from the original wording. He considered it to be mistaken. Well, what was the mistake? On page 95, which is what I just read you, the feminine, Kuntu Zhang Mo, is changed to the masculine. Change to the masculine. And it appears twice. But the whole point of the passage lies in the symbolism of the union of the male and the female aspects of mind. He makes a, a, another note. It's hard to understand how there could be such a mistake. So the big difference between Prungpa and Evans Vance, you see, is that Trungpa insists that this is a mistake, and it's exactly the reverse. The father should be this, the mother should be that. And he says it's a mistake in the translation by the original Tibetan uh, who worked with Evans Vance in the translation of this work. Now, um, a lot of things follow from that, of course. Um, schools divide and 
people get ranks and people get lower ranks and people are called names and all kinds of things happen. But um, for those of you who enjoy this, which I'm sure you all do, on page 12 and 13 in Evans Vance, um, there is a very interesting introduction, which I really recommend to you, by Evans Vance. And on page 13, he has a whole description about these two terms. And by the way, he says the pure consciousness is uh, masculine. So he's got a, earlier he agrees that it's one way and later he changes it. All right, now let's see what's that issue. Okay, let's see what's that issue. There are two. Would you not agree that in principle there's always a difference between a pure one and a unity? A unity is one, but it must have parts in a union. When they describe these two as a union, which is what they do, right, then this is a union of two. Therefore, it's saying, in the experience of divine luminosity, it is possible to make this distinction. On the one side, Right? divine radiance and the other side what is conscious of it right? and uh, that thrilling shining blissful thing divine radiance or I should say the effect of it is shining thrilling blissful unobstructed this takes on the name of the mother. This takes on the name of the father. Right? Pure consciousness. But in any case, it's a dual. There is a dual here. And there's a union. Would you not agree, in principle, that the conditions for something, the conditions for something, whatever it may be, the conditions for a cause or anything must always right, be prior to <clears throat> the thing, to the cause. Okay, what do I mean by that? If you're going to light a mat, Right, I can say the cause of the fire is that I struck the match and it ignited. And by the way, there had to be certain conditions for that to be possible. There has to be a certain temperature possible. Right, there has to be an, an ignition point. There has to be a kindling uh, aspect. There has to be certain conditions for a cause to be a cause. Right, for a cause is one thing, but that without which a cause could, could not be a cause is quite another. Right, the conditions are always prior. Therefore, the conditions for a union or unity must be, must it not, that there must therefore, the condition for a unity must be that there must be a one. Oh, now this is very curious because if this is the highest perfection, this is the perfect enlightenment, by this consideration, we're saying, uh-oh, wait a minute. That presupposes that there must be some unitary power that can bring those two together. The condition for that must be the existence of a one in some way. 
to be able to bring that about, the condition for this. Well then, either this is merely a linguistic distinction that doesn't have any metaphysical merit to it, or we are saying that necessarily there must be something prior to it that is, that is its very raison for existence, its very reason for being, and therefore there must be something higher than that, and that must be the one. Now, this is called the problem of unity and of the one. That's what it's called. In Plato's Republic, in Book 7, there's a very famous paragraph. I know at least seven people who are involved in it. That's a lot, isn't it? And he makes the distinction, you see, between the one, or the good, same thing, and divine luminosity, what he calls the most brilliant light of being. That's because the most brilliant light of being. This is the object of Plato's entire metaphysics, to reach that, to be able to experience that. That's the divine luminosity. That's what he calls it. He said, going from the everyday world into this is like going from Hades to heaven. That's the way he describes it in the Republic. Now, in Plato's Republic, though, you see, he says in a very interesting passage in Book 7, he said, this stands like a king as this stands to a queen. This is the royal family. That's what he calls the royal family. But in Plato's Republic, the whole goal is to bring people through the Republic, a spiritual exercise, the entire thing is a intellectual yoga, right? to bring them to this state so that they can then, having experienced that, go here. That's the whole goal of the Republic. That passage from this to this in Plato can only be accomplished, of course, by first experiencing this, but this is the path that, and the purifying power of the dialectic. because there has to be a dialectical exploration of this state so that you can free it of all of the kinds of terms that suggest a duality. That's where he is, that's what he does. So, this then is how Plato, Trungpa, Evans Vance, Lama Govinda, Woodruff deal with his splendid idea, and uh, I want to assure you I enjoyed presenting it to you, and I'll take some questions. Sir? Um, as you said, all the time it keeps insisting that you don't realize that you are dead. Yeah, okay? again and um, again, again and again. But um, it mm -hmm. reminds me, one of the poems of Rumi, he says, mm -hmm. I was dead and now I'm alive. Mm -hmm. And so isn't, aren't they talking, and early on you said that it should be in a way upside down, that when they're talking yes. about death, yeah. aren't they talking about in this life, yes. we are dead in as much as we don't realize our Buddhahood or the clear light? Oh, well, that, you're absolutely right. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, one of the, one of the, uh, yeah, we, we could we'll redesign this, won't we? Right. We'll do it this way. This is the greater reality. And this is when we fall asleep to our real nature and have to struggle to wake up 
and this is where we are caught in, in being attached to all kinds of things and our intellect is befuddled and confused. Yes, quite true. Therefore, this is really the land of the dead. As a matter of fact, you can have a lot of fun with that idea. You know, you can tell people that, uh, say, uh, nice furniture you have here, very nice furniture. It's all dead, isn't it? Skeletons of trees you polish. Nice car you have there. You dug up metal from the soil that was dead, right? And pound it in fire. Spray it with paint. Do you admire the car or the paint? Right. And then when you eat, how much do you, what do we eat? I know. We're in the world of the dead. We're all dead. When you admire someone, say, lovely skin, the dermatologist would say, excuse me, do you know what you're admiring? The dead, dead skin is on the surface of the epidermis. It's, it's, it's already dead. You, know? you paint it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there are a lot of allusions to that. And equally, well, in the uh, Tibetan uh, game, as well as in uh, Plato, by the way, um, we are closer to reality in becoming conscious of our dreams than we are in our waking world. So they are levels or, or planes, because as I think of the quote I made before, that there are six planes. The seventh one is yet to, that's the highest. And we live on a certain level, and we have to work our way up. But yeah, yeah, I like that thought. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was making another comment. Uh, when I first read this about 30 years ago, whenever, mm -hmm. it fascinated me. Near the end, when you're yeah. about to be reborn, oh, it yeah. goes through the Oedipus complex and Electra complex. Yes, there's yeah, the Oedipus now, complex. Years ago, whenever. That's right. It's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whichever one you, you, you fear and you're attracted to, yes, that's absolutely right. I like the way they choose your country and the religion, too, yes. all the way down. It's a blueprint, but, uh, yeah, good, 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 good. Um, so that's the subject of dialectic you were saying earlier, to move or at this level, it's moving from the most brilliant light of being to the one. I don't know. It's a moving way. It's definitely being in something that's different than what you're in for. If you could be in it. So, how could that be a dialectical exploration in the most brilliant light of being? Would you be even able to participate in dialectic? One of the most uh, important points about the idea of the one philosophically is that there are no possible predicates you can make of it. It's a dia negativa. You can only say negatives about it. Right? It's not a whole. It's not parts. It's unlimited, et cetera. It has no form, et cetera. Right? But would you not agree Everyone who experiences this divine radiance all say the same thing. That's reality. That is. You're saying something about it, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, it has predicates. Oh. Perhaps you're taken in because you think that something that thrilling and blissful must be the highest thing in the universe. How curious. Um, would you agree that anything that is must have a cause or not? Or do you think some things happen to be without being caused? What was your opinion? Sure. Oh, oh. Would you agree then that if someone says reality is, that must be something that is, and there must be a cause for it? Therefore, what's the cause of that blissful? radiance. If there is, there's something higher than the blissful radiance. For the cause of something must always be higher than its effect. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. But, but, but how do you go beyond the radiance? I and mean, what's up with that? 
what's up with that? Yeah, how does that happen? Going you mean, beyond this most blissful, thrilling experience. Usually with uh, tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, it's like you have to put more words on. Wait a minute, how do you go? Want to talk about yeah, that's what I don't understand. If you had an experience like that, you wouldn't have tennis shoes. Or if you yeah, okay. Look here. In the middle of it, would you not agree, as far as the person is concerned, there can't be anything higher? Right. Right. That's it. Right. People who experience it are willing to, if they could endure it, uh, enter into it more fully, uh, give up their life for even for penetrating it even that much more further. Right. Total, total acceptance, right? Okay. But they do say it is, don't they? And must there be a cause for whatever is? Oh, must the cause have a higher status than whatever it is that it produces? Oh, must the conditions for this be higher than the thing itself? This, this is very disillusioning. This, is a, this philosophy is extremely disillusioning. Because after all, hey, this is it. What can be greater? What can be more beautiful? What can be more radiant? What can be more blissful? What can be more real? Well, if it is, there must be something that causes it. Is that correct? Don't you want to find out the source of that? Yeah. Then you just stepped out of this looking for its source. That's the dialectic. Is that when that state doesn't last? The, the, uh, you're quite right. Um, a, a way of putting that is the samadhi you can go in and out of is no samadhi at all. Uh, you're probably familiar with that expression, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you get into samadhi, it has a beginning, middle, and end. It's bounded. You have to step out of it at some time. Um, <laughs> I gotta share, I share a story with you. Um, there was a discussion with a very interesting Roshi, and um, the student asked the Roshi, um, is it possible to be in that state Remain in that state. And uh, the Roshi said, uh, why? He said, well, would it not be a state where you don't make any distinctions? Roshi said, yes, won't make any distinctions. Then if you're in that state and you're eating a hamburger, then it's likely you'd start chewing on your fingers and you wouldn't know the difference until you got to your elbow. <laughs> Um, this very hot. This is a very important matter, right? This is this is the, this is the highest level of, of playing this game. Um, on this issue, uh, this is the for those of you familiar with it. Uh, sometimes this is called the eighth ox herding picture, but there's the ninth and the tenth beyond it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you had your hand up, please. So the uh, <coughs> guy stay. The, the, the chick state. But it seems to me that you mentioned that this is a very fleeting state. Yes. So I would imagine it's not even really a matter of free will. Of why oh, you're no. not wanting to stay there. You just don't stay there. That's right. For whatever reason. Yeah. I guess what he's saying is what's the reason? Because he would want to stay there. Or is there a reason why you don't stay there? What's the Yes. What's yeah, the there's a reason you can't stay there. You it's overpowering. Stay. It's draining, totally, it's totally draining. You have to have great strength to endure that. But is there now another state, according to Plato, which is beyond that? That's the, that's the Platonic tradition, Neoplatonic tradition. And the implication is that you'd want to go to this good state because you've experienced the other one. If, if, like our colleague here just got the question, I think, right? Okay. Um, is, does it cause some distress to think that maybe there's something beyond something so thrilling and blissful? 
Not beautiful? Yeah. This is the problem you see in another land, in um, Hinduism, um, in the Bhagavad Gita. What, what, what is it beyond the, that light? See, that, that's the highest point in the Bhagavad Gita, the light. And you only get that when you get into um, um, oh, Shankaracharya. That's, he pushes the upper limits of Hinduism, Shankaracharya. And he separates himself from uh, um, oh boy, got to get back to my Hinduism. Ramanujan. No, 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 no. Gee, I've lost my Hindu. I haven't been in Hinduism for a while. Right on the tip of my tongue. In any case, um, the, I, I would say that the highest expression of this in Hinduism is Shankaracharya's, the crest jewel of wisdom. Major thinker. God. I used to enjoy reading him. Kondra Kirti. Kondra Kirti is one of them. Good. I got one of them back. There's another one lingering in my background, in my memory. Please? Does one argue the cause of one? No. The one, because since it has no predicates, it isn't a thing which can be said to have a cause. Only the only things that have causes. Yeah. See, yes. Well, the, 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 you could explore it, but what kinds of things can be said to have causes? Only something that can do be be defined as being something. Right. Why is not the one? But the one is not a the one is not a thing. Why not? Because that would be a predicate. Finally. And the dialectic on the one, you can't even call it a one. It becomes the nameless. Right. That, that is the way that yeah. I think it has yeah. Yeah. The Buddha and those who jumped outside like the cycle of rebirth, are they in that Chikai state because they're not looking for anything greater? That's called the old Buddha. The all good Buddha, Chikai, yes. And it also is called the all the all Buddha and all of the Buddha enlightened ones that ever have been. Because we, Buddha is, is a title, right? From Buddhi, which means uh, mind, mind. Pure mind. It's a Buddha. His name is Gautama, but the title is Buddha. Uh, this person with the develop recently, and that is just before you're born, some entity, whatever angel, whatever you might want to call it, really bangs in the head and says, remember, yeah. it is only reality. Whenever you know, you're freaking out, yes. remember it's reality, yeah. which yes. I, it's only illusion, it's only samsara. Yeah. Recognize this is the contents of your own mind, because yes. in that period, you're re you are experiencing all the past karma of all your prior existences unfolding rapidly as you proceed through them all. So you're going through all of the different worlds of experience that you've ever had a part of. So you continually go through that each time you die, born. And then we are in the river of forgetfulness. Right? That's truth in Greek, right? Aletheia. Right? Not remembering, right? To forget, river of forgetfulness. We forget our own enlightenment. I thank you very much. I enjoyed doing it for you.